a minute. Silent Night, Bloody Night. That's kind of like the title, Silent Night, Deadly Night, which clearly means that this movie won't be as memorable. How dare this 1972 film rip off the title of a more popular 1984 film? And don't give me that whole excuse that technically more people probably own a copy of this film because it's on every single horror compilation DVD ever. It shouldn't matter that I already own a dozen copies of this film. Silent Night, Bloody Night is a Christmas-themed horror film about spooky, murderous things happening in a horrible death house. Death houses are funny like that. They keep trying to sell this thing, but the bodies keep piling up. And worse yet, it has mold. The movie was filmed in 1970 under the title Night of the Dark Full Moon and had a good life in the drive-in circuit before landing in the public domain. And unlike Silent Night, Deadly Night, no parents protested this movie's existence, probably because they had more important shit to do in 1972. Alright, let's start this thing. Oh great, the movie is already lost. It's beautiful now, as if nothing had happened here. If nothing happened, then why am I watching it? The main house in the film was built by Wilfred Butler. It rests in a weird place where snow can suddenly transition in over a sunny day. Unfortunately, it's right next to a hog plant. Other than that, I doubt that there's anything wrong with this house. Ah! 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 I'm sure there's a story there. The flame in the fireplace is thinking, Don't look at me, I was in here the whole time. Ah, it was the candlestick with Mrs. White. And in case you didn't know, Wilfred died from the fire. That the deceased, Wilfred Butler, died as a result of burns inflicted accidentally upon himself. Ugh, those old-timey photos taken post-mortem are creepy. This is a canon production, though, so it's possible the fire could have been started by Chuck Norris. Hey, go ahead and cut to the alternate title card. This is a Christmas film, though, so let's hear a little bit of that Christmas music. rather hear the depressing Silent Night Death March than I would 12 Days of Christmas. Merry Christmas! Let's now cut to a funeral. After the coroner's inquest, on New Year's Day, they buried Wilfred Butler. There was no one there to mourn him. Mainly because we couldn't afford a lot of extras. They couldn't even get a full set of pallbearers. Look at this lazy ass, not even helping! They don't even care what year he died, just that he's finally dead. Twenty years later, though, the house is finally being sold by Wilfred's grandson, Jeffrey. They're burning this flyer because it may contain spoilers. Not that you won't be instantly distracted by the next scene. <laughs> Jesus, I guess the cinematographer wanted out of this film, and fast! Lawyer John Carter, played by Patrick O'Neill, is sent in. Wait, why am I explaining this when we have a narrator? The man who came to sell the house had never seen it. He was a lawyer from the city, just doing a job and enjoying it. You don't have to explain everything to me. I can figure some shit out myself. Carter is sent to make sure the house is sold by noon. Hmm, this room would be great for a McDonald's play place. The angry cinematographer regrets burning those bridges. He just got offered to film The Taming of Rebecca, and he hates needles. The new cinematographer, however, gets easily distracted. Yes, thank you, those are birds. This must be the right place, although East Ben has the better theme song. Hopefully this isn't one of those weird small towns. Mr. Carter. Mr. Mayor. 
Yikes. Dean Stockwell is definitely gonna be singing in dreams somewhere in this town. Ha! <laughs> hey, that's John Carradine. I bet he's got some great lines. The matter concerns the house that he inherited from his grandfather, Wilfred Butler. It must have been very hard. It must have been hate. Thank you, Don Hector. This seems like an easier role than the one he had in Frankenstein Island. By God, so much talking. Cut to something more interesting. Well, that doesn't mean I want a dog to die. The 70s was a different time. Santa put severed dog heads in naughty kid stockings. Patrick O'Neill has to hurry up with this scene. He's got to get Sean Connery's Diamonds Are Forever wardrobe back to him. He decides to stay the night at the death house, and the reason he isn't scared is because he may be Freddy Krueger. Meanwhile, the chief has to get back to being Joe McCarthy. He's a big lawyer, Bill. You've got to expect that. Don't tell me about lawyers. Oh, you see the way he looked at us? You see his clothes? He's doing his job. Just don't tell me about lawyers. What, is he Chewbacca with a bell? How do they understand him? I can tell everyone's having a fun time in this film. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm having a fine time. Mm, I totally believe you. <laughs> the only thing that cheers him up is the fact that he hid John Carradine's call bell, and now he actually has to talk. What then? Tear it down. Ish. The voice has seen better days. Oops, sorry, the Deadites have already moved in. Might as well stay anyway. Wow, Denise Richards has truly never aged. I've been complaining a lot here, but at least the movie isn't a musical. And he walks with me and he talks with me. Uh, don't be a musical! Should I go murder him now? No, 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 not yet, not yet. Must wait until later. He's smart, though. He's wearing Pamela Voorhees sweater. That'll keep one killer away. But it doesn't stop this riveting conversation. Did you pick the wine, too? The delicatessen man took a personal interest in its selection. Oh, well, we got lucky again. That's early 1970. That's hard to come by. Can I have some, too? Of course, of course you may. You can't trick me with this obvious clinker brick product placement. I've already bought 200 cases. Meanwhile, the Riddler is too busy looking at nudes to care that Patrick O'Neill is about to die. This is getting intense. Oh yes, Miss Howard. Yeah, the phone's working fine. Uh, very nice of you to go. Thank you. Good night. My god, their phones are working. I was worried they'd be paying their phone bill for nothing. This may look hot, but those furs haven't been cleaned. It's a bloody mess under there. Ah, uh, good, the James Gandolfini and Shelley Duvall photos are still there. Now we can cut to our topless scene. I know they're having sex in a horror film, but surely they won't kill off their top billed actor. Shocking. Patrick O'Neill should go out in a much more dignified manner like this. What the hell's going on? The party's just beginning. <laughs> Getting shot by Gary Busey in a dress is how I want to go out. The killer calls to tell them that the call is coming from inside the house, which should be obvious, they have an operator. Meanwhile, a wandering Elliot Gould steals their car. What does that have to do with anything? And why is Mary Warrenoff giving people suffocated birds? Ooh, an intruder. You better stand back. No one's getting coal or severed dog heads this year. The late James Patterson plays Jeffrey Butler, and something seems a little off about him. Almost as if he's escaped from a mental institution and has been killing people. Have you any ID? Come on. Don't laugh at me. I want your ID. Would you like to see my maniac card from the asylum? They give you one when you escape. Don't say it like that. It seems like you really are crazy. 
Poor Diana here just wants to go back to wrapping bird cages like she does every night. Doesn't even matter if it's Christmas. I keep wondering why this movie is so dark, but it looks like they're burying the lighting, so that could be why. No, don't shine the light on me. Shine it in front of the camera. There, thank you. Those bastard Texas Chainsaw 3D people are still hiding the dates. For God's sake, this isn't taking place in the 90s. At least this guy is kind enough to already be in a cemetery when he dies. Oh, we're back to Diane's again. Oh, good, because their first conversation was so riveting. Hi. Hi. Did you find the deputy? No, I wasn't there. Trivia note, many actors in the film are known for being part of Andy Warhol's factory, such as uh, Mrs. Potts, uh, Jim Rockford, and Naked Lunch. Wait, is she playing solitaire to pass the time in the movie? Lucky, I'm stuck here having to take notes on this thing. Diane decides to go with Jeffrey, and this is Calamity Jane's slowest death race to date. The race is on Moody Art Film Highway, my favorite highway. It's next to Bergman Boulevard. It's best to hang out here since it still has the best lighting. Wait a minute, clues. Someone left their sunglasses in the snow. Makes sense. So fucking bright outside. But nothing can turn the lights out on this blossoming romance. You still want to go to my house? Yes. But, but I don't want to go alone. Hmm. <laughs> Sexual chemistry. Meanwhile, they still haven't perfected virtual reality, so people have to sing to pass the time. Is this movie actively trying to put me to sleep? Seeing how the movie is co-produced by Lloyd Kaufman, Sergeant Kabuki Man had better put a stop to these murders awfully fast. That way I can complain about it being unrealistic to Kabuki Theater. Just do something here before it gets awkward. I'm sorry, this is Jeffrey Butler. He's the one who's selling the house. He can't get inside the place. Oh no, there aren't gonna be two creepy character actors on this set. He says she hates the place. Would you like to drive there? He's jamming his fists on the piano, a yes, I don't speak 70s instrument. There's much rejoicing, though, because Diane hasn't killed all of the birds in the county. Unfortunately, John has to take a wicked piss, leaving Jeffrey all alone. It's what Diane would have wanted. Surely Death House won't kill an old woman, though. Even a Death House has standards. He's just gonna sweat the information out of her instead. He really needs to know where Lips Manless is. Oh, and Death House doesn't have standards. I was wrong. But we do get to hear more Death House backstory. The person on the telephone said 1935, Christmas Eve. But that's not the beginning. But more importantly, the Showplace 8 is first built in Springfield. Oh, and we find out more about Wilfred's daughter, Mary Ann. Wilfred Butler's daughter is cruelly attacked and raped. Her name is Mary Ann. Yeah, I don't like a very grindhouse Christmas. So much for this movie getting its security deposit back. Oh, good. These two together again. Jeff, how old are you? How old am I? You mean, how many years have I lived? No. There's a lot in the paper about your family. I don't want to talk about my family. Wait a minute. There's a woman calling, and she says her name is Mary Ann. That was your mother's name, wasn't it? Hey, let him answer the age question first. I've been dying to know, apparently. First, the movie stole James Bond's suit, and now his car. Will the thievery end? On the plus side, they finally have some proper lighting, and back to that death race. Twenty points! 
sure wish all this happened closer to the fire so I could tell what was going on. The dialogue isn't doing much to excite me either. Somebody cut off his hands. You killed him. You killed Tolman. He's asking for help. Why is everyone acting like they're in Franz Wirth's Hamlet? Everyone in this film is acting like a dysfunctional family going through the motions just to get through the holiday. Huh. The movie actually kind of makes sense to me now. The possible killer soon calls the mayor, claiming to be Marianne, even though the caller clearly has a male voice. Oh, and the death house used to be an insane asylum, as if the house couldn't be more devious. By 1935, the doctors had treated my daughter for a year. I had believed they could cure her. Damn, twas the night before Christmas is a lot different than I remembered. I don't remember it having a distinct Salon Kitty vibe to it. The real twist is that Wilfred's brain is actually a young girl on a swing. Never mind all this exposition, though. The turkey's ready. I, for one, am enjoying the fact that the movie switched over to an old silent film version of Dracula. That is, if Dracula were about Wilfred having an incestuous relationship with his daughter. Yep, that's the look of a man who just realized he's an incest baby. Anyway, back to Silent Night, Old Boy Night. This is where Christmas ends and Halloween begins, as the patients at Smith's Grove just wander around. It'll make for a damn fine box cover. The Silent Night Death March music begins playing again. Makes sense. This scene is about as Christmassy as something found on Live Leak. This is one fantastic Bioshock Infinite cutscene. Why didn't they just use the old timey camera to film the whole movie? This is way better lit. Not to mention, I'm pretty sure I'm watching Alternate Universe Don't Look in the Basement. The real victim, though, is Diane, who has been waiting patiently in the car during this whole flashback. And now he's stolen James Bond's tuxedo. The thievery won't end, it seems. Oh, and it appears as if Jeffrey is the killer, because that's what the movie and this review wants you to think. I waited for you. Psych! The killer is incest, Dad! Even though Jeffrey was driving some of the victim's cars, holding weapons used in previous killing sprees, driving to and from the crime scenes, and killing random birds, I disagree with this movie's twist that Wilfred is the killer! Not that Diane cares. She can't even bring herself to protest in front of a bulldozer to save the trees. They will tear down Wilfred Butler's monument. But they can never destroy my memories. I've already forgotten what happened here, and I just watched the thing. So is Patrick O'Neill the killer? I got no time for moody, slow-burn thrillers with an extra dose of sleaze. I need more senseless violence in my horror films. That way I can complain about that instead. Well, some characters hummed Christmas music. Christmas is mentioned a couple of times. Hans Gruber's other brother, Franz Gruber, did the music. And it's a more realistic movie than Last Ounce of Courage. So, I guess it's a Christmas film. And it's in the public domain, so it's got a remake called Silent Night, Bloody Night, The Homecoming, plus a sequel that was made after the remake called Silent Night, Bloody Night 2, Revival. I sure hope they tie up the loose ends, like telling us Jeffrey's age. Boy, I sure am glad I finally reviewed a horror film, since all of my episodes in 2016 were religious films! Except for Death Wish 2 and Zombie 3 and Enter the Ninja, and Turkish Batman, and Superman 4, and Three Dev Adam, and Wonder Woman 74, and Dangerous Men, and Doctor Strange 78, and Grease 2, and Going Bananas, and Ghost Fever, and Independence Day 83, and Breakin, and Breakin 2, Electric Boogaloo, and Slumber Party Massacre, 
Slumber Party Massacre 2, Friday the 13th Part 7, Halloween 6, the theatrical version, Halloween 6, the producer's cut, Trick or Treat, Spaced Invaders, The Magic Christmas Tree, oh wow, man, there, there really were no other genres to choose from in 2016, damn. And Bushwhacked, and Donald Tramp, and Ten Inch Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Sex Trek, and Strokemon, and... Night, Mr. Toman. Have a nice holiday. <laughs>